evidence that would be found on things, but I found something to be distinctly wrong with it. You see, there's nothing wrong with saying that what God says, we believe, and that settles it. But the point is, it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not, right. it's settled. Right. And so I want to uh, deal in some aspects in regards to that. Um, professing Christianity has a lot of different views about inspiration and preservation. And Brother Longzine dealt very well with that uh, to the extent that I was kind of wishing we could have been flip-flopped as far as places because he stole some of my thunder, but that's okay. He's a good friend of mine. I'll harass him later. We're staying at the same place tonight. Now, uh, the person in the world uh, is not going to understand this argument. It's not going to understand the dilemma that we see today. In fact, it's, it's long been my opinion that the average American can tell you three things about the Bible. And then that's where their expertise ends. Number one, they know that Jesus turned water into wine. They assume that has to be alcoholic wine because that's what they want it to be. Regardless of how many scriptures we can show them that prove that it wouldn't have been. The second thing that uh, they know is that the Bible says judge not. They're not sure who that was said to or the principle behind it or the context or the verses that follow, but they sure do know, judge not. And the third thing that they know, and it's not always correct, is the Bible says, thou shalt not whatever they happen to be against that day. It must be in the Bible somewhere because I feel it's that way, so the Bible says, thou shalt not whatever I don't like. Had a man came up to me after a service not too very long ago, and uh, he wanted to uh, contradict me for no other reason than to be just a general overall pain. That's the kind of man he is. And he came up to me and says, you know, the Bible says, and then he told me one of his dislikes. I said, oh, does it? Where does it say that? Oh, well, well, you know, the Bible says, and then he told me another thing. I said, really? I don't know that. Where is it? After about five or six times, there was a growing group of people that were hanging out, and he kept saying, well, you know, the Bible says, Finally, I said, you tell me all these things that the Bible says, and you haven't been able to show me where any of them are. He said, well, you must not know the Bible very well. I said, make a list. Bring it back. I'd love to be shown to be wrong. I said, bring it tonight, tonight service. How about that? Well, I can't make it. Not surprised. What the result was, he had things in his own mind or in his own life that he thought he could prove, and so he just threw a lot of uh, scripture out there, he thought but none of it was scriptural in fact. Another thing that the world will often say when they're trying to prove something that they think to be biblical is, well, everybody knows. If you haven't, write this down. Go to YouTube and watch Dr. Phil Stringer's message on the Septuagint. And he deals with that phrase very, very well. I have often, Dr. Stringer, I have often put that message on in my office and listened to it over and over again. You will not be disappointed. But I want to spend my time dealing with four particular aspects of this topic. God said it, and that settles it. As is often in the case, uh, speaking here at the KJBRC, I, I find myself surrounded by speakers that are uh, much more qualified, a great deal more knowledgeable, far uh, better read than I am. And so uh, I hope to add uh, just some thoughts that might be uh, encouraging to you. Uh, certainly my material is not as deep or intellectual as theirs, but hopefully it will be a help to you. The first question is, did God in fact give us his words? Did God in fact give us his words? There's an absolute necessity in answering this question properly. The reason being, our eternal destination and our spiritual growth hinges on whether we believe God gave us his words or whether we have things that were given to us by man because they felt like it or they thought that. Now, my wife and I, Rachel and I, have four kids. Stephen is 10, Katie is 7, Trisha is 5, and Reuben is 2. Oftentimes, when I get home from the office and I'm starting to get out of my car, they'll come running to the car and say, Daddy, Daddy, can we do this? Can we do that? Are we going out for the evening? Can we have this for dessert? Do you have ice cream? The important things in life. And I always say this. What did mommy say? And sometimes they'll say, well, mommy said to ask you, or I haven't asked her yet. But there's one particular response they have that draws my radar. It's when they kind of take their eyes away from you 
and they get this devious look on their face and they'll say, well, mommy said, and I know one of two things is happening. Mommy gave them an answer they didn't like or they're about to change what mommy said <laughs> to fit what they want. Yeah. One of our children in particular loves ice cream ever so much. Every night, can we have ice cream? Often the answer is no, we don't have any in the house. Well, the grocery store is still open, isn't it? <laughs> yes, but no. There's a particular way children have of twisting things to try to make it suit them. As we grow up, hopefully, we get out of that. But not always the case. Well, that's what we have found in, in relation to the scripture issue. When direct questions are asked, sometimes people will say, well, I don't know. But oftentimes you get that, well, and you know that whatever comes next is something that they've twisted to fit their narrative. I want to look at a couple of passages of scripture throughout the message today for you to think about. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to look at some verses, and uh, this is one of uh, my favorite passages in regards to the authority uh, of the scriptures. But we ask ourselves, did God in fact give us his words? In regards to the uh, bumper sticker that you could see in days gone by, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, did God in fact say it? Look at Proverbs chapter 22. I'm going to read verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. You see, we're to be made known the certainty of the words of truth. In a day of uncertainty in so many aspects of our lives, where we don't know how things are going to be, when things change constantly, one thing that I do enjoy is knowing for sure that we do have the words of God. I appreciate that. There's so many things, there's so many people that change. You're not sure where you stand with them. You're not sure how things are. But when it comes to the scriptures, you don't have to worry about that. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, uh, when you look at a passage of Scripture, it's important to remember uh, which person God used to write this down. First and Second Peter were clearly written by Peter. All right, that's not rocket science. But when you consider the kind of man that he was when he was a disciple of Christ and how God ma allowed him to mature, uh, it's very encouraging to anyone. In First Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15, the Bible tells us, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I would ask those who try to undermine the doctrines or the teachings of preservation and inspiration for that matter, whether they can know the certainty of the words of truth how can they give an answer if they don't know for sure what the words say? I was once in a rather spirited debate with a young man who was asking about biblical preservation, and I noticed that all he had were questions that were designed to create confusion and doubt. He had no answers. He had no opinions. He just wanted to ask questions. And so I began to ask him his same questions back to him, and he had nothing. No, no authority, no ability to answer the questions whatsoever. I call that, or my dad does rather, I don't know scholarship. There are people who actually think that they are intelligent because they can say, well, we don't know for sure, or it's impossible to know this, or impossible to know that. Saying I don't know doesn't make you brilliant. But there are many in the issue in regards to the scriptures who think that saying how much they don't know makes them seem smart. I don't understand it, but they do. Now, the same could be said when some try to undermine inspiration and preservation when they try to change what the scriptures have said. Oftentimes, they'll try to counterfeit it to appear to be genuine. We were just uh, in our board meeting earlier today looking over something that has come out recently to try to change the King James to bring it up to date linguistically or the language thereof. And oftentimes, there are attempts to make something seem genuine when, in fact, 
it's a fraud. Years before my uh, brother moved to Brazil to be a missionary, he worked at Staples Warehouse. He worked with a man uh, who very much admired Ford Mustangs, specifically Mustang Cobras. Now at the time, uh, I actually was driving a Ford Mustang Cobra, and so my uh, brother was very familiar uh, with the differences between a Cobra, a GT, and a regular V6 Mustang. And if you don't know, there's a difference in regards to uh, the size uh, of the engine, uh, the speed, the sound, the upholstery, things of that nature. Well, this man very much wanted to have a Mustang Cobra. And so he bought a regular V6 Mustang. Then he proceeded to change things like the body kits, the upholstery, the exhaust, the trim, and even did things to the uh, engine to try to make it sound and run like a Mustang. But his plan fell through when someone actually looked inside the car and noticed that his floor mats were spelled C-O-R-B-A. He was, in fact, driving a Ford Mustang Corba. <laughs> and word got out very quickly. I, I won't say who let the, the cat out of the bag, but word got out quickly. That's just a regular Mustang. He spent far too much time and far too much money dressing up a regular Mustang. It would have been cheaper, it would have been easier for him just to buy the regular thing. We find the same thing when it comes to Bible translations. People go to great efforts to try to make a fraud or a counterfeit look like the real thing. They'd just be better if they actually submitted themselves to what the scriptures say. Did God, in fact, give us his words? Yes, he did. Now we find that um, people have been told to stay away from the King James Version. Most of them don't have any idea why. In the scope of my ministry with reaching out to Roman Catholics, I often get uh, requests for literature and scriptures and tracts, um, often from prisoners. Some of them mistakenly think that we are a Catholic organization. And they'll request things like rosaries and, and crucifix, prayer books, etc. But occasionally I'll get a request for a Bible. It'll read something like this. Could you send me a Bible? Any kind will do, as long as it's not the Protestant book, or as long as it's not the King James Bible. When I write them and ask why they don't want that Protestant book or a King James Bible, no one really seems to have an answer. They've just been told to stay away from it. They don't want to take it for its face value as being the words of God. One man wrote from East Tennessee, and this one struck me as amusing. He said, please help me. I'm stuck in the heart of Baptist country, and can you send me a Bible just as long as it's not a KJV? Well, I was glad to help him, but not in the way that he expected. When you look at the Dark Ages, the overwhelming push was to keep people from getting the Bible in their native, or as they called it, vulgar tongue. The game plan hasn't changed that very much. Now we have a, a plan that says if you can't forcibly keep people from the scriptures, and then what you can do is try to discredit them or tell people they're not truly the words of God. It's what man has written. And people have accepted it hook, line, and sinker. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll look at verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, when God gave his scripture, he told the men what to write, and they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I can tell you as a man, I am very, very thankful it didn't come by private interpretation. Here's why. As a husband... I don't always understand everything. That may come as a surprise to some of you. Our wives will understand. But occasionally I'll get a text from my wife, and I'll read that over and over again. We've only been married for 12 years, so you'd think I have it figured out by now. But I don't. So I'll have to call my wife and say, Honey, what did you mean? And she'll explain it to me. Can you imagine... If scripture was given by the private interpretation of man, and we would not have the ability to text and say, hey, 
writer of the book of Hebrews. What did you mean? Or Paul, what were you feeling when you wrote that letter to the church at Corinth? What were your true feelings on the matter? We don't have to do that because we know it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's our job to learn it for what it truly is. One of the staples that you'll hear at any conference in regards to the scripture, and it's not anything new to you, is, is 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You'll often hear preachers say that essentially that means to tell us what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. So in answer to the question, did God say it? The answer is a resounding yes. The second question or point that I would want to uh, raise is if God breathed his word, did he in fact settle it? Has it been preserved? I look up the words settle and settled in our scriptures and combined they only appear a total of 16 times. The word settle means to be appointed fixed, resolved definitely. It means to be without any doubt or wavering. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, Peter wrote, But the God of all grace who hath called you into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. How can you be settled in regards to the words of God if they haven't been preserved. I live near Washington, D.C. People often politically talk about the intent of the Constitution of the United States. They often refer to the Declaration of Independence. Do you know there is a place called the National Archives where you can go see them and see what they say? You can look at pictures and see what they say. We have manuscripts that have been faithfully copied and passed down. We can do that, but we also have a translation that has been faithfully and perfectly translated with the preserved words of God. Brother Longsine quoted Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We know that they are settled. We don't have to worry about it. This brings me to my next point. What if the words of God are difficult for us to comprehend? Dr. Dan Hafley, who isn't here, um, did a, a research in regards to the readability of the King James Version. Others have done this, but they have submitted the text of the King James Version into software to see the readability, the grade level it requires to be able to read the King James Version, and have found, not surprisingly, that oftentimes it is equal to or less than the grade levels of some of the versions that have been sold to us as much easier to read, including the ESV because there is something about the way the King James has lasted. But there are three points in regards to this that we, can, that we can rest easily in. Number one, you don't have to understand everything to believe it. I don't fully understand all the implications of the law of gravity, but I believe in it. Every morning when I try to roll out of bed, I believe it. I don't fully understand the hybrid and gasoline fuel injection system of my car, how they work together to make my car work. I don't fully understand it, but you know what? I believe it works. It got me here. I don't fully understand everything in this scriptures, but I don't have to fully understand it. It's my responsibility to believe what God has given us. Number two, the Holy Spirit will guide the seeking soul who truly wants to learn. In John 16, Jesus had been speaking to the disciples and he told them of the persecution that was going to come. And in verse number 12, he told them he had many things to tell, but that they were unable to bear it. Verse number 13, Jesus said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. How does the spirit of truth guide us or lead us? Brother Longsine said it just a little while ago, John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. 
we can rest assured in knowing that we have the words of truth. The third answer, what if you can't understand everything? Number three, sometimes we don't understand because God has hidden it from us. There are actual truths in the scripture that are hidden from us that will be brought to light later. Now, I'm not for people that come out with new fangled ideas, and oftentimes they're completely off the wall. But the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. Now, keep in mind, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. They had very real issues in their midst, didn't they? So when he's writing in Corinthians, remember who's writing and to whom. Well, in verse number 7, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, Paul writes, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. In other words, there are things that can't be understood, but God will make them known unto us. Later on in chapter 4 and verse number 5, Paul said, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. In other words, there will be a time when God brings things to light. We don't always have to understand everything. We do have these fascinating things called dictionaries. You know, one of the greatest, or I shouldn't say greatest, one of the most common arguments against the King James Version is the words are so hard to understand. I have a smartphone. On my smartphone, I have the Bible downloaded. That's not difficult. But I also have this neat app called dictionary.com, which I reference often in all sorts of different readings that I have. The resources or the ability to find out what a word's word means is easier now than ever. When I was homeschooled as a child, my mom had her college dictionary. And if I didn't understand a word or know how to spell a word, guess what my mom would say? Look it up in the dictionary. Now, in fairness, I hope my mom doesn't see this, but how do you look up a word you don't know how to spell? It made for some very interesting moments, and uh, I looked at a lot of pictures in dictionaries over my childhood. But we have amazing resources that completely take that argument and blow it out of the water. We have dictionaries that are easily obtained. People will try to discredit what the scripture says. Some people act as if they're smarter than God. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 4, in the first part, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. In Psalms chapter 2, the Bible tells us that God uh, sits in heaven. It speaks of the heathen and, and the kings that are setting themselves against God. In verse number 4, it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Knowing the scriptures, understanding the scriptures will help prevent you from falling for scandals or conspiracies that go against scripture. Case in point, when I was in college and I went to a secular school, it was the time when academia was insisting that we were heading into man-made global warming, that the increase in temperature was going to create coastal flooding, and we were all going to drown because cars are bad and industry is bad and capitalism is awful and so on and so on the story went. Sitting in a chemistry class and the professor was telling all of this nonsense, and I asked her if global warming had ever occurred to this extent in the history of the earth. She said, no, no, it never had. I said, will the, mol the melting polar ice caps Will that exceed the amount of water that evaporates because it's going to get hotter so more water will evaporate? Oh no, the ice caps are going to be much, much worse than the evaporation. I asked her, how do you know? Well, I said, this has never happened before. How can you possibly know this? How are we going to destroy Mother Earth when God said he's going to take care of that on his own? June 2010, this one's my personal favorite. June 2010, ABC produced a report that with climate change, Manhattan would be underwater in five years and that we were destroying Mother Earth. In June 2015, which if you're doing your math in your head is exactly five years after their five-year report was to have taken place, I took a trip to New York City. I took a detour on my trip. My wife said, where are we going? I said, I just want to make sure ABC's headquarters are still here. 
and they're not underwater. Sure enough, they're still on the Upper West Side even today. Man has told us recently that the ice caps are disappearing, but then they admit that they manipulated data. When confronted with record-breaking cold in different locations, they can't explain it. I wonder how long it'll be, Dr. Stringer, before they start going back to the Ice Age threats that they made back in the 1970s. I predict that'll be a short time in coming. Heaven forbid that climate actually change back and forth, back and forth. These are the same people tell us that evolution is, is a great way to think of things and that anything left by itself will improve over time. I'd like them to spend some quality time with my two-year-old and see if left by himself things improve over time. It's not the way the universe works. But the Bible says God will laugh at their derision. What's it mean? Eventually, lies grow to the extent that they can easily be proven to be false. Unfortunately, professing Christianity has fallen into the trap of sacrificing right from wrong, biblical versus worldly, at the altar of trying to appear to be intelligent. It's become in vogue to question God and His Word in an attempt to seem smart and get the praise of a godless, onlooking world. After all, can you imagine a time in history when it was safer to eat chocolate or bacon than it was to eat romaine lettuce? It's a good time to be alive, young folk. It really is. I'm sorry I didn't bring the chocolate today. Tomorrow it could be different. But science, I'm not kidding, once taught us that tomatoes were poisonous. Science wasn't smart enough to realize the acid in the tomatoes was reacting with the pewter in the plates and drawing lead out. People say the science has been established, to which I ask, which science of what era? Because science constantly changes. A report came out less than a week ago that was published in the New York Post that said that all of mankind really doesn't have that much genetic diversity, and that we are all the descendants of one man and one woman. My first response, and it was rather sarcastic, was, hmm, if only we could have read about that somewhere in history. If only we had known that mankind came from one man and one woman. I'm also afraid it's kind of narrow-minded for them to be gender-specific that it was one man and one woman. It won't be long before there will be those who complain about the report. But you see, science has a hard time when they try to vary from what God has said, and then ultimately the results bring them back right to exactly what God had said. Because God said it, and that settles it. Psalms chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So in response to the message title, God said it, and that settles it. The middle part of that expression, the bumper stickers from days gone by, come into play. Do you believe it? That's the crux of the issue. We can have all the intellectual arguments, and they're crucial to have in regards to God's word being settled, being inspired, being preserved, being translated properly. But the crux of the issue has to do with the heart of each person, because you can tell a whole lot about someone by their heart in regards to the scriptures. Man may or may not believe what is in our Bible, and of course, that is their responsibility most people in this world, and sometimes even professing Christianity, do not believe that God inspired his word, do not believe that he preserved them, and do not believe that they've been properly translated for us. We cannot control what other people think. We can try to show them what the scripture says and what history truly does teach. And that is a discussion and, a, and an argument that we try to have in a dignified and Christian manner. But in a nutshell, can each and every one of us say in our hearts, God said it, and regardless of whether others believe it or not, in my heart, that settles it. Dr. Brown, I'll turn it to you. You know, since they've indexed the genome 
that has caused evolutionists <laughs> nothing but problems. I was reading the same article, uh, hmm, very interesting that we all originated from one man and one woman. Amazing. I read that a long time ago. <laughs> all right, you have a little longer than normal, so we are.